We're rolling. Timer starts now. Mark. Hi, I'm Ford. And I'm Sky. And these are not our real names. These are our superhero names, and with our powers combined, we formed the writing partnership L. Skyford. Welcome to Booklandia. Today, we're going to review a book, most likely a romance. But before we get much further, did you know you can watch our faces do this episode by subscribing to us on Twitch at L. Skyford or YouTube at L. Skyford? You should really do it. We give good face. And sometimes there's a dog bomb at Ford's house. This is true. For our other socials, you can follow us on Twitter at Skyford L, on Instagram at L. Skyford. And if you're interested in our book, blog, or even more book reviews, head over to our website, lskyford.com. Lastly, this and every episode are chock full of oversharing and spoilers, and every episode is rated E for explicit. You have been warned. Hi. Hi. I feel like we're finally back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> well, we did we did record some uh, out of sequence things recently. Yeah. So yes, this is yeah. this is the first one in a bit. Um yeah. And our previous episode was the crossover with the peony and it was just like lady energy everywhere. Yes, also that. That's true, yeah. Yeah, also yeah. that. So um, I'm good. I started physical therapy yesterday for my scoliosis, for my invalidic lifestyle, <laughs> my sedentary invalidic lifestyle. Um, and she gave me all these exercises that basically only like strengthen my scapula muscles. Like all I do is pinch my scapulas together and it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest hard, hard stop, full stop. All right. Okay. Well, that sounds yeah. very cool long term. Maybe not in the moment. Hopefully. Like every doctor I've ever been to before this physical therapist was like, you should just do yoga for your scoliosis. I'm like, that's not a treatment. <laughs> that's a referral to a yoga studio. Thank you. Exactly. Um, does your and insurance and cover yoga? <laughs> no, it does not, which is further the point. So I told this to the uh, to this new doctor and she's like do you want to keep doing yoga and I was like not really I'm not good at things and classes and <laughs> stuff she's like cool let, I'll give you some at home exercises I was like this is what I want active like directional I want hard answers yes that I, I do I yeah. do find that to be a lot more reassuring and it feels really satisfying to be like I went to the doctor and I got answers as opposed to exactly going, to the doctor and here's the bill <laughs> and, right. I, and I did not get answers so that's my I'm, sorry go ahead I was gonna say I'm excited you got answers my favorite part is that she had to teach me how to walk apparently I don't walk right okay I can see yeah. that yeah yeah I don't swing my arms and when I do I swing them with the leg that's moving. And she's like, no, you got to swing those opposite. And I'm like, this does not compute M robot. Oh, very cool. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. my, my brain does the opposite swing. Uh, without Same me swinger. thinking about it. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Even as a child, I never swung my arms as I skipped. Like I was just like robot skipped. So I have to swing my arms now. It's a it's doctor's orders. Uh, that's sorry. My 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 mind is my, like mildly blown. I'm I'm picturing you walking to like really uh -huh. correlate this information with with life. Can confirm. <laughs> Look, if people are interested, I'll throw a video up on our story. But if people are not interested, I guess it's our little secret. <laughs> I'll throw the Perfect. video straight to you, Sky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> excellent. How are you? Um, I'm actually going to forward my how am I doing uh, for a couple of things <laughs> that have to do with this episode. Firstly, uh, okay, great. I don't think we even mentioned uh, what we're doing today. We are talking no. about Heartbreak for Hire by Son Sonia Hardall. And yes. uh, before we get to it, I feel like we should do content warning on this episode, we, cool. like right right away. And it, I don't mean a this episode will contain spoilers. That will also be ca the case. That's a gift. 
Yeah, but this book deals with um, gaslighting and abuse of power and abusive relationships and hatred of a particular group of people. And I feel like we should put that out there for people to be aware of before listening to our episode, before reading the book. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is, uh, this is it's very performative and I apologize in advance, but I want to <laughs> do our apology, my apology parade about this episode uh -huh. right now, like before we get oh, into the episode. Okay. Um, you are d telegraphing for the I, audience. I, uh, I'm trying not to, but I do feel that I should say this. We are going to, this, this book deals with uh, feminist ideas and we're definitely going to talk about feminism. And I want to acknowledge the fact that I intersect in feminism at a different point that other people do. And that there will absolutely be things that I'm going to say that are not applicable to everyone. And I do not mean to say them to exclude people. And if anyone is listening and disagrees with anything I said and has the emotional bandwidth to reach out, I am fully open to listening. Uh, I am fully open to learning it on my own as well. I just, I just know my foot and mouth is raging. Mm -hmm. And so I will put my foot in my mouth. So I just want to put it out there, put it out there right away. It's already started. <laughs> it's already started there. Like the, the foot got in the yeah. way of what I was saying that, uh, I am probably going to say something that will anger you. And, uh, it is not my intent to anger you. <laughs> Well, that inspired me. I shall also do my pre-apology parade, my pre-parade. Um, I am. I took one feminist studies class over 15 years ago. I am not a feminist historian. I know what I've self-taught myself. Self-taught myself. We're going to go there. <laughs> uh, so if I get anything historically wrong, emotionally wrong, uh, I just, I think both Sky and I are asking for some grace. And these are just our fucking opinions. Yes, true that. Um, and <laughs> fascinatingly on this book, uh, I, I feel like we have really disparate opinions. But I think, like, just based on the little bits we've talked about, the things that irked us are the same. It's the level of rage yes. is different. Yes. Um, agreed. So, uh... Uh, let's I, intro. Let's do the blurb. I was trying to. I was like, do we do the blurb next, or do we do hot takes next? Yeah. Let's do the blurb next for those who have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, oh, before we yeah. get there, here is the cover for Hardback for Hire. For those of you listening, mm -hmm. it is a pink background with a water cooler and a, um, a gentleman on the left side and a lady on the right side standing by the water cooler. That is what the cover is truth <laughs> all right okay. uh, oh and it comes out on july 27th or has come out on july 27th so yes. uh, excellent there we go okay great uh do you you wrote this so i should i should read this huh okay very good you and can think... i'm also happy to because it contains jokes uh, okay well i hope my delivery my cold read is yeah. not awful um okay. you want to cow me in <laughs> okay all right and a five, six, seven, eight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Brinkley works as a heartbreaker, helping her female clients get revenge on the men who wronged them professionally, romantically, or otherwise. But when her boss, Margot, hires men into the all-female company, Brinkley finds herself working with one of her past Marks. Hee <laughs> hee. Ironically, his name is Mark. A Mark she got a little too close to. Brinkley uses her job as a crutch and a safety net, but with the safety net is down and the fact that her job isn't the pillar of feminism, it looks like on the outside, Brinkley has to make some hard decisions. Oh, right at the buzzer three-pointer <laughs> to give basketball terminologies. Uh, well done, sports ball terminology. Sorry, I was really into your um, <laughs> explanation of this and I forgot yeah. about the timer. And then it was like, timer, <laughs> timer. Um, so yes. Yay. So the important things, the important, I feel like characters to know while we're talking about it, Brinkley, um, who's our uh, female lead, Mark, Margo, who's the boss, 
And then there are other heartbreakers. There's Brinkley's mom. Um, this is this is where we're at. There are other Marks not named Mark. There are many other, yes, people who are not named Targets. Mark. Targets, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> So Let's here's just deep here, side to get into this. Okay, so here's where I'm at. Um, what I, so this book uh, talks a lot or presents a lot of ideas, bigger ideas than just a rom com. It I feel like like rom com is the the the, the book it's going to be shelved. It's it's the shelf this book is going to be put on. Oof, sorry about that, but um, uh, but it's not it's not truly just a rom-com. So many things in this book that happened in this book kind of counteract for me what the book was trying to say because the book has a particular yeah. message and then things happen in the book that are inverse of that message. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, it, well, and that's my read of it. And maybe some people read it and they're like, no, it's exactly on message. So my question is because, so this talks about what feminism is and whether or not it is inclusive or exclusive of people who identify as men. Um, it talks about whether or not uh, misandry is the only way to be feminist. Um, it talks mm -hmm. about uh, whether or not the only way to, uh, to best an abuser is to abuse them or to harshly judge them. Um, so, but I think, um, and I think it asks and all those questions. And then it you think those are the them. messages? Well, I yes, yes. I guess we okay, should. Great. Yeah, okay. I do think those okay. are some of some of the messages. I mean, one yeah. of the other messages that I received very clearly from this book is that being an artist is completely bullshit and get the fuck out of the way. Uh, people who work in academia could just get that shovel and dig themselves the grave. Um, and yep. a couple of other like super harsh, not okay things like um, people who have erectile dysfunction need to be made fun of people who lose their hair need to be made have fun of people who have kinks that are like tame kinks as long as everything is consensual need to be publicly insulted yeah so there's th so there are some other things that this book says that i assume like aren't the messages so this is really my question right. here my question is okay. it is my assumption that our author did not mean for us to get all of these, uh, in my opinion, negative moments out of the book. And so my question is, how do you, do you think our author was able to guide us through the book in such a way that at the end of it, we receive the messages that she meant us to receive without assuming that we've all taken feminist theory in college, without assuming mm -hmm. that we went to college in the first place? Because it really, right. like, I feel like knowing feminist theory, there were certain parts of this book that I was like, oh, this is where that's going, or this is how this is being subverted. But without it, what really frustrated me about this book is the fact that I think people will read it and take it at face value. And that face value is very, very not okay for me yes. altogether. Right. Because the face value is... Brinkley has this job where she gets revenge on men. She feels not okay about it, but she still needs this job. So she keeps going on with it. And she keeps like being in this toxic work environment, uh, which keeps getting more and more toxic for her. And then she decides to follow her dreams and support women in the end. <laughs> like that's, that's the baseline levels Brinkley story. Kind of, yeah. And then there's like a lot of personal discovery and growth that does not happen. Um, mm -hmm. At least I didn't, I didn't feel it happen. But my point is like, it is not self evident that what Brinkley's doing or what the mm -hmm. Heartbreaks for Hire is doing is not okay. There is one line in which Brinkley, yeah. for herself, decides that it is not okay for her. Mm -hmm. But it is never discussed how toxic, how negative this environment is. And if you're someone looking for a fun read, 
without really getting deep into it. Like, you might be like, hilarious, one of her fallsies fell out and she rode a mechanical bull. And like, hilarious. It's yeah. not funny. Like, it's super not it's okay. Not. What she does is not okay. And I don't think that the book makes that clear enough. And that's my concern yeah. is that there, because there are times where I feel like when I read a book and I'm like, I'm not sure that this was self-evident. And this was one of those books where it was like, this yeah. was not self-evident. And that really worries me. Yeah. The, the feminist, uh, and I've just forgotten all words of the English language. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> feminist messages in this book are, uh, Brinkley thinks them, and then she uh, denies them. She says, oh, I'm just being stupid or whatever, when she's actually being gaslit into thinking that. And then the like she decides to be this art gallery owner that only displays women's art is like the nice, fastish bow on the end of this book I've ever seen in the history of, like, it's, there, there are so many incredible layers to this story that I know that I don't have enough feminist theory to get all of them, which I thank, thank gods you're here because you have a clearly more layers to this, but I don't know how much Sonia Hartle intended to write because it's, there, there, there's so much in between the lines and it's such a fraught discussion but what intrigued me about it is that it's a fraught discussion we are having about a romance novel. Like we are talking about toxic feminism, which no one is talking about right now. And it's come from a romance novel. So I, I want to. Uh, yes. I want to introduce you to an entire TikTok generation of radical feminists <laughs> who are talking. Uh, <laughs> you just you just got to find them. On the I on see. the appropriate platform, um, they but, have yeah. to come over to old people Facebook because that's where <laughs> I'm at. Um, so the conversation is happening. I absolutely agree that romance novels don't, on the whole, this is a very generalized statement, don't engage in academic discord discourse. Uh, in Discord, they might engage. I don't know. I don't hang out <laughs> on Discord too much, but um, I absolutely agree. I do think that that's meaningful. Um, I, but I, so, yeah. but this is, but this is also, I mean, I think it's meaningful that we're talking about it when discussing yeah. a, a romance book. That's wonderful. I, and I, and I'm not, I don't want to negate that romances aren't feminist because they are hella feminist all the time, but this is acad like academic feminism. So my it's, concern it's is, is that, yeah, the, the overt nature of it is not translatable and I'm not trying, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that people are dumb. I am just no. saying that without guidance from the author on which which path, like which stream we're all traveling down, and I did not think that she gave us enough pathway, enough room. And so she, I made I, I made decisions, you made decisions, and they were not the same. And right? so he my concern is, Yeah, Maybe. and so my concern is is that it yeah. Mm -hmm. I needed I needed more um, clarity. You needed a stronger voice. I did, I did, and it was not there. So that really frustrated me because all of the negative bits, all of the bad guys, I'm putting that in quotation, that exist mm -hmm. in this are very strong and are like phoenix from the ashes, which is what I think Brinkley is meant to be in this, is um, mm -hmm. not so much. Kind of like the super yes. ugly naked bird situation and not the glorious rebirth. <laughs> yeah, 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 yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just to paint a visual nope. here. <laughs> no baby is attractive on their in their first few days. <laughs> no, no, just mm, no. Yeah. Um, so you you mentioned the the negative. Do you want to uh, dive into the negative experience with academia? That yeah, so, yeah. Okay. So this is where I was really concerned for Sonia Hartle personally. There are times when I will read a book and I'm like, is this the opinion of my character or is this the opinion of this author? And I genuinely did not get like, I don't know if this was just meant to be Brinkley's negative experience with academia 
or if something happened to Sonia Hartle in academia, and this is a little bit of her lashing out. But all I know is that there were no redeeming qualities to being in academia. And I am not saying, as a, as a person in academia, I am not saying that it is without fault. It is absolutely faulty. There is absolutely politics. There is absolutely backstabbing. But not across the board. Not in such a blanket statement that I felt like I should immediately um, quit my job and disown everything that I know about myself. <laughs> Uh, immediately, like instantly, because I am part of a system so toxic that it ruins children at all times. And like my, my entire job is is educating children. And, and now I'm like, Ugh. young people, young, adults. young people. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. They are no longer children by the time they get to me generally. But so my concern <laughs> here is that there was never a conversation about the positives. There was only a conversation about the negatives constantly. In fact, at the end of like one of the one of the conversations about her relationship with Mark, she just like tosses in a grenade about the fact that he's already done 50 hours. He's already on the pathway to being completely sucked into this wormhole that is academic life. What happened to this woman? Yeah. Well, Brinkley, the character, was raised by uh, a an academic robot mother with no empathy or compassion. And so she I think she sees academia as the monster that stole her mother. But that like, isn't ever made out of her. Yeah, but I that know, isn't right? ever made clear. It's just yeah. like they're just these yeah. sentences upon sentences of just like dumping on the entire process. Mm -hmm. She does not believe, Brinkley does not believe that Mark being a professor is worthy or that that is his dream. Yeah. And she gaslights him yeah. into not believing in it, which is just crazy. And is one of the instances that I'm talking about where like, yeah. while pointing out gas gaslighting, you gaslight someone else. That's insane to yeah. me. And like, she has no respect for any of them. And it's oh, very discouraging. So, so, I mean, isn't that equitable it, that, you know, you expect gaslighting male to female, but a woman gaslighting a man, that's equitable right there. But we don't ever discuss the fact that it's gaslighting. I know. She just I know. convinces him that he wants to be a middle school teacher, even though that's not necessarily what he wants. No, he says it. He says he always dreamed of being a middle school teacher. And she's like, oh, well, that that's your dream now. You have to go get out. <laughs> you have to get that dream now. And I was like, that yeah. that's not how it works. Also, right. when her mom suggests that she become... I just want to make this really clear in case people are not academics. When her mom suggests that she should apply for a tenured job in a department in which she's not qualified in, nor does she have a degree in, they're like... No, like the HR department wouldn't even accept that application, let alone. No, 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 no. But no. her mom is going to put in a good word. So, you know. But uh, nepotism is also not the way. Like, no, just no. There were so many comments that I was like, that is not how it I works. Know. You actually even have I knew to be that. qualified for the job. <laughs> like, and that's what she kept saying to her mom. And her mom's like, no, nah, I can make it happen. And I'm like, who is this monster woman who can control the whole major university system. Like, I have to provide so much proof of guest artists that I bring in to make sure that they suit the needs of our students. It is not just like show up and chit chat about anthropology. That's not how it works. And I was really <laughs> frustrated because it was like, just slather some shit all over it and we'll just go on on our merry way. And I'm like, no, no. Um, As a counterpoint to this, how to fail at flirting discusses ah, toxicity in academia, but it does so by about. still elevating the good bits of it. Yeah. And it just does I it so much out cleaner and better um danny brown uh discusses toxicity in academia and still points out how it can be absolutely rewarding and glorious and validating and that part wasn't there and so i just worried that something 
toxic happened to Sonia Hartle in academia. And it like, this was catharsis <laughs> for her, but like troubling sure. for me. I absolutely yeah. felt attacked as part of that group of people. Mm -hmm. sure. And like, there was never any like, but you know, like there's at least two or three good ones. No, like every, every single part of it, everything about it uh, was just awful. The guy, the guy who was retiring. Dr. Farber. Cool. Faber. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she he points out that the library is nice. <laughs> yep. Yep. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, I'm gonna pivot us. I'm gonna transition us into my question. Okay. Uh, so Margot is Brinkley's boss at Heartbreak for Hire. And I assert that she is the real antagonist of this book. Uh, when it starts, you and Brinkley are like, she's kind of weird. What's with all this tea? And, but also like, fuck all these terrible men that they're getting revenge on. Yay! They deserve it. Uh, but then you realize that Margot is insidious as hell. And she is gaslighting these women and centering herself as their mother slash savior figure. Like, she picks them up when they are at their lowest, gives them a job to get revenge on the people, uh, the metaphorical people who have wronged them. And then she tells them, you're not ready for the, you're still not ready for the real world. You need to keep working here. You're not strong enough yet. And at the end of the day, so uh, one of the, my quote, I took a quote from the book and I'm going to read it now. At the end of the day, she didn't give a shit about women, but she'd found a way to commodify feminism for a while. So I want to talk about the misandry of this book and the toxic feminism and the dangerous path that leads. Well, so firstly, Margot isn't just insidious. She's like Bond villain bad. <laughs> like she's sure. so bad that I was expecting the cat for her to <laughs> pet. We mm -hmm. don't know Margot's story at all. We know nothing about what let her to open this business and what hurt presumably she's carrying with her at and all. Because of that, all I could assume was she saw these vulnerable women and is taking advantage them. of them. It's, it's an opportunity. So having said that, I hesitate to say that this is toxic feminism. This is just one toxic bitch who is using women's weaknesses to her advantage mm -hmm. and and spins it out as if it is feminism right like what she practices right. is not feminism no what she practices it, is capitalism. hate and yeah. capitalism right yeah. what she practices is exploitation of people who are emotionally in a vulnerable place that is not mm -hmm. feminism at all. Nope. Not even a little bit. Not even on the sidelines. No. Sure. <laughs> so I use the definition of toxic feminism as uh, all men are X. All men are Y. All men are terrible. All men are assholes. All men deserve this. So that is my very broad definition of toxic feminism. And I feel like Margot employs that in order to continue I mean, she definitely women. implies that one man is exactly like any other man. So the mm -hmm. all, it is all men rather than not all men, right? The inverse of not all men. Um, mm -hmm. So she, she does point out that like this guy is exactly like the experience you had. And so this guy deserves oh. the exact same situations as, as your person. And to make it extremely clear... No person deserves to be hurt or mm -hmm. or harmed in any way. Uh, a person deserves maybe a stern talking to. A person deserves but an explanation they... of how they hurt someone. But, like, you should not... Seeking revenge does not actually make you feel better or get that person to listen to your reasons. It just makes them more angry at you when they understand that you've caused them harm beyond I, what's already happened. I'm apparently having an out-of-body moment because I'm about to quote the Bible. <laughs> yes, you, what? what? 
An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. I mean, yeah. So, uh, you know, this is also where it gets into my personal beliefs where I'm not at all the person who's like, this person has done something terrible to me. Let me do it back to them. So, like, the entire premise right. of this from the get-go wasn't cute or funny or fun for me. And so it surprised me that it took Brinkley three years, two and a half years to be like, this seems shady versus like, uh, I'm wearing a false butt and have put on a wig. This is totally normal. This is exactly what everyone does. Sure. To be fair. To be fair. Uh, it, I feel like at least halfway into the story, Brinkley's like, I'm done with this job. I just want out, but I need the money. And it's just a job to her. And so I think she does begin to distance herself from the morals of the company once Margot burns her by bringing the dudes in. But also, I, she sees the toxicity, but she can't escape because of job security, which let's, I mean, we could just crack open the whole nut on classism and and all that, so... Oh, no. Uh, job security, absolutely relatable, especially considering that mm -hmm. she points out uh, how lucrative the job is. But, like, yeah. she, so Brinkley didn't get the memo that this is not morally great until men came into the picture, which, yes. from a pointing out feminism standpoint, is yep. fraught with a lot of, like, you needed men in order to realize that as a woman, you were doing something immoral. Well, she finally had a mirror to all of her actions. Like, a living embodiment sharing her office, being like, oh, this is this is what ha what we do to people. Stare like, breathing in her air. Yeah. Again, it was not, like, as a concept, not explored well enough. Um, yeah. And yeah. then, like, all of the tiny, weird microaggressions that pepper their interactions. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm particularly thinking of when they go to the, uh, to the cowboy bar. And yeah. instead of doing her job, she keeps territorially invading his space and yeah. interrupting his conversations with other women, despite the fact that they're at work, arguably. Yeah. And their work is insidious, but they are at work. And, like, just because he talks to another woman does not make him less interested in you. That's she not woman. how it he works. Man. He, her man. No touchy the her man. Uh, like, yeah. hard no. Absolutely not. That's not how it works with what? your romantic partners. That's not yes. how it works with your platonic partners. Every person gets autonomy. And if you cannot give a person autonomy, walk away before you get, like, thrown off a mechanical bull. Exactly. Uh, correct. F fully agree. However, what if that is a commentary on how men treat women? Because that is so commonplace... That does anybody notice anymore? I mean, yes, people notice, but it's ex so extremely commonplace. I do agree that it is very commonplace, but do you think that was clear? Oh, no. It's taken me... How, how long ago did I read this book and the 35 minutes we've been recording this for me to have that idea? I think I, you're absolutely right that it might have been implying that the inverse of this, where men um, impose themselves on women's conversations with other men because they feel insecure, happens in, in heterosexual romantic interactions all the time. But mm -hmm. that that isn't clear. And the, and the microcosm of like being at a bar and flirting and feeling, yeah, feeling insecure. Yeah. Yes, you're you're absolutely correct. Food for thought, blah. Um, do, so where, I think we've kind of talked about where you draw the line on like toxic feminism. Do you think that there is any space whatsoever where women as a whole 
have grounds to treat men as toxically as they have been treated by men. Do you, a, do you think we have any grounds for revenge? That's a really, okay. So this is where it gets into my, my privilege, uh, 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 all of my privileges, which are not okay. singular. My response, my, like the ideal response for me would be that, no, that, that, that responding with aggression towards an aggressor does not ultimately educate all of us and put us on an equitable playing field. Responding to an aggressor with aggression just just gets that aggressor more agitated, right? Would, Having said that, what? Okay. Go ahead. Would responding objectification with objectification does that have the same response for you? Not for me. Okay. Because okay. okay. Figuring out the scale here. Right. Not Talk for me because I think that uh, then, so if, if someone objectifies me and I objectify them back, that might send them the message that we're totally chill with objectifying each other because I've mm -hmm. just repeat, like I've mirrored the action. Instead of me shutting down the objectification in the first place, making them understand that it isn't okay to objectify rather than uh, right. Re like, so if someone punches me and I punch them back, they're like, oh, we're punching now. We're fighting. That's totally fine <laughs> right. because you've given yeah. me permission to punch you back versus right. you punch me and I get you arrested for it because punching is not OK. Punching you yeah. is not OK. Punching me is not OK. Right. So that's where I come from. However, comma. I exist in a bubble where even if I don't stand up to misogyny, I will still most likely have a job, most likely have a life, right? Mm -hmm. Most likely not be so objectified that I would want to leave a particular circle of people. I can, I can, I should not, but I can brush it off and continue on work. That is privilege. Mm -hmm. And that privilege doesn't exist to everyone. So there are, and, and th there are, and I should, and I, I'm going to be, I'm going to like be really brazen and be like, I totally do. I don't always, but I should stand up and I should educate people and I should absolutely not permit them to behave in the, in, in, in a misogynist way or in a sexist way or in a, um, in a way that is disrespectful to anyone. Um, but I live in a privileged enough place where if I don't, it is not entirely harmful to me personally. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, of course. I think that there is a place and I want to support that place. And I don't always because of my creature comforts. Uh, there is a place where you get to shout from the rooftops and you get to objectify mm -hmm. and you get to punch and you get to get arrested. But the, your act of violence is one that gets noticed and examined and prioritized. Um, so I don't want to say that there is no place for misandry and there is no place for responding with right putting a mirror to what they're doing mm -hmm. but i do think that where where i stand i don't do those things and i i feel like i can say maybe we can just talk to everyone and educate everyone but i also understand that that's faulty logic and that that doesn't work every time and in every instance Right. I feel Have like... Have I made sense? I think, yes, you've made sense and you've clarified your, your not boundaries, but where, the place from which you're coming from. The TED Talk from which you were having. Uh, no, no. I, I, just a joke. Uh, I think about it in terms of, is there a lesson that is going to be learned? So if I call someone out on their sexism... Are they learning something from my call out or are, are they, is it going to escalate? And like, so every situation is unique and individual, of course, and only do things you are safe, feel safe and comfortable doing. So, uh, you know, I've started calling out sexism in television at home with my male housemates because 
if I don't do it, I don't know if they're going to notice because it's so prevalent. So like uh, there are small steps that folks can take, but yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it requires bigger action if you have the safety to do so. Yes, right. And I, concur. It, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and uh, I have to tell you that I have now started calling out, uh, like, micro-misogyny in my house while watching TV because you're absolutely right. Uh, it Sometimes I'll point it out and uh, and then uh, men who are watching TV with me be like, oh, that's, oh, I did not clock that. I did not notice that. I have also pointed out, like, this is a wonderfully feminist standpoint. Let's elevate that. Mm -hmm. Let's make that louder. And they've been like, mm -hmm. oh, I also didn't notice that. Uh, so I have I've taken your cue and have also done it in my life. Huh. Well, thank you. Uh, it's uh, made me better at recognizing it faster as well. So it's it's a practice, feminism practice. Yeah, so I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, yes, we do have to be loud, but I think we have to be s safe and loud because otherwise I don't know that we're teaching the right lessons. But again... Yeah. Like I, I speak it from a safety of a of a place where I yeah. can say that. Yeah. And like, of course, I have these like wild imaginings of like someone wronging me in some way, and I wrong them equally back. Oh, you want to violate my body and touch my body without permission? I'm going to violate your body and touch your body without permission, and then I break their nose or something. But like, that's an imagination. That's not a real thing. This arm can't break anything barely a seal on a pickle jar so like reality and imagining aren't the same but i also this book had required me to confront some of my my own personal toxic internal feminism and really put that to a microscope and say am i actually is this a healthy path for me and the answer is no and and it i've used it as more feminism practice so it What's being the, the, the path of way? revenge. Yeah. And the and path of extremism and more opportunities to recognize gaslighting when it's not called out as gaslighting. Yeah. And then the second time you said it, you meant it, the book. It, it Probably. made you. Yes. <laughs> I say things and then I immediately forget them because the storage is full on this computer. <laughs> Yes. All right. All right. Um, so um, I want to talk about Brinkley. Also, I want to talk about Brinkley's name. Because Brinkley okay. is a dog. Like, I kept being like, Indiana was the dog's name. Like, maybe it's because there's literally a dog that lives across from me named Brinkley. This is, this is oh, yeah, not fiction. This is 100% you then. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, Brinkley's a dog. Brinkley's not a person. Um, so I had a hard time with her name. I mean, I sh really should not speak. My name is also complicated. But um, but then, so, to me, Brinkley is a character. And I think maybe this is the crux of the entire thing. She did not lead the story. She reacted to everything that happened to her. Even when she, and I'm putting this in quotations, took charge of her life, she was still very reactionary. And... I, yeah, she reacts, like, so I had a really hard time with trusting her as the main character, um, trusting in what she believed in what she said as the main character, and then ultimately rooting for her because mm -hmm. I just, right, everything she did was a reaction to something that happened to her and a, a truly, like, a character that is evolved into a, a more mature or and right a more together air quotes character is one that sometimes makes decisions before it is reactive so i i ha my thought is brinkley comes from an incredibly emotionally and psychologically abusive relationship that is how she the breakup from that is what got her into Heartbreak for Hire. That's her prologue, her backstory. Uh, that, it, it's a fight or flight, well, it's fight, flight, or freeze response. She has frozen in her life 
because of that previous terror. So all she's just, she's a ghost through life because of that. And I think this, it, it's again, not as good as, it's not done as well as How to Fail at Flirting that breaking in and reclaiming your life and your existence from your previous assault. Yeah. Should we break? So I, I should agree. we break here? <laughs> should we break right here in the middle? Assault and cut to break. Oh my uh, gosh. It, yeah. 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 I, I think about it in terms of acting and like if a character on stage only reacted to things, what nothing happens in a in a theatrical show um like dear evan hansen is kind of like that like all he does is react for the majority and then the very final moment he actually does he makes a choice uh and that's the whole crux of the thing but it never i guess none of brinkley's choices felt her final choices never felt like final choices no so no they did not yeah they did not yeah okay yeah we're gonna okay, take now intermission, intermission right here when we come back we're gonna break down our favorite moment from the book and discuss our ratings and if this book made us want to get naked. Please enjoy this message from one of our friends in the podcasting world. Oh, hey, it helps when I turn on our microphones. <laughs> okay, great. I thought because I looked at my phone that my headphones had switched Bluetooth. I, like, I no, like, sorry oh, about shit. that. No, it's absolutely me. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Let's try this again. We're back and we're talking okay. about a hard, hard Break for Hire by Sonia Hartle. Um, and uh, now our microphones are on. <laughs> Excellent. This is going to so good. So much good content right here. Yes. Um, we are. All right. Let's talk uh, compelling moments, favorite moments. Did you have one at all? So I did not. I rage screamed through all of the generalizations that this book uh, put into the world and then did not explain them as generalizations. They were just statements of fact. And I was like, this is not a fact. This is just a generalized statement. Um, there's a lot of white privilege. There were, yep. it's a, it's a very white cast of characters. We, mm -hmm. there's, yeah. So I did not have a favorite moment or a moment that really drew me into this book and did not break because of like a throwaway sentence that was really mm -hmm. rage inducing for me. Sure. I uh, found myself enjoying any of Brinkley, Brinkley's takedowns. Um, there are over the top and they're she's wearing crazy outfits and you're rooting for her like well i i found i was rooting for her and then i see that it's going to go terribly wrong and you're just watching the the rail like the the train come off the rails of that thing and but then they just became cringy in the end and the toxicity was back and you're like oh that's what i just watched and I, ha I, I will state that I am extremely heavy handed with, I, I can't separate uh, toxicity from something content wise. I don't think that's safe. And I think that is self gaslighting if you ignore the bad things about something. And so that really kind of took everything away from, from the book. So, and then also these gigs, these marks that she goes after, like her, the way she does her takes takedowns get progressively more and more emotionally abusive towards these marks and and just to no to no point it's like her arc is become a worse person and then all of a sudden become the best person absolutely no so it was yeah that was hard no. okay um yeah. hot take um, I gave it a Stephen King four stars. So, uh, uh, it would have been five stars, but like all of this toxicity was really disappointing. And the only reason I'm not giving it a two stars, in fact, you're influencing me to drop some stars out of my rating is because it made me think so much and it made me challenge myself so much 
So I'm not giving four stars to the book. I'm giving four stars to how I reacted to the book. Okay, that's um, that's valid. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and and then in the for the end of it, when she's talking about telling Mark like how poorly he treated her, she never teaches him that he gaslight like he did terrible things. He was toxic to her. She's like, oh, I just love you, and I'm gonna take you back. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was one of the moments that it was like this this negates everything this book has yeah. been talking about. Um, yeah. I really worry about how people will read this book and what parts they will take away because mm -hmm. I don't think that it has a clear enough message of these are the examples of bad behavior and these mm -hmm. are the pathways to better behavior. I do not think that that was clear enough and that really frustrated me in a way that made it not okay for me to uh to to recommend this book to other people so that's my hot take is i would recommend um uh, how to fail at flirting instead yeah. sorry so zero stars well i give it one star because zero is not an option but yeah sure. it was uh it just i I think there is too much toxicity with too little conversation about why and how it is toxic and mm -hmm. not okay. So yeah. that's where I'm at. So it didn't make you want to get naked. So can we please this? I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to move further away from my microphone because I'm going to yell about this. <laughs> can we talk about the scene with the acrylic paints on the couch? And can I just tell you yeah. that the moment they squirted paint, onto the wall and we're just like whatever red paint on the wall of a rental apartment a paint that does not come out of the wall i was completely over it and they hadn't even started the getting it naked parts and then she rubs acrylic paint into his hair and yep, i was like like a like a three-year-old if you've ever attempted to remove acrylic paint from your hair you know that this is not cute or sexy, it is torture. Actual Guantanamo Bay torture. <laughs> so that kink, I'm, I'm gonna have to be like, please explain, because shaving his head would be faster than removing the artist grade acrylic paint out of his yeah. hair. Now, there is paint that you can use in your sex play. It is non-toxic and edible, and that is supremely fun. And you should 110% try that. It's a textural experience. It's super fun. Go for it. But not with art store acrylics that are expensive and are not made for this and contain latex and they put on a condom and latex on latex is bad and can break the condom. Welcome to my se se sex talks, te TED talk. <laughs> Just Here. no. And then they get it in the couch and they get it in his suit and you will not get acrylic out of a suit, you bitch. Yeah, I was really taken out of it by the fact that these tubes of paint are fucking expensive and they're just squirting them out everywhere. And I'm like, oh, privilege, 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 privilege. It was uh, it was really problematic for like I as an artist, I was so triggered by the experience that I was like, I don't, I don't care that this is supposed to be hot. I was like, I no, there is a way to do this. This is not it. Also, like, please look up some non-toxic water-based paints to play with. They are so much fun. Also, put a drop cloth down. Don't do it, like, straight up on yeah, your couch. I was, about to, I was about to say rubber sheet, but okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, rubber sheet is also great. But, like, something or, you know, just, just a drop cloth. Um, but it's, it's a super... It should be treated. Exactly. Drop super yeah. like it's super out there. This is this is definitely a sex act that is a bunch of fun, but you cannot do it with artist grade acrylics. And no, hard no. Nope. <laughs> I didn't no. Mm -mm. Not okay. <laughs> How about you? So no, you did not get naked. I did not get naked because okay. it was just All so right. like it was just so problematic for me. <laughs> So I say yes, only because the first scene when she has this like magical date, not date with Mark, and then he goes down on her, like that scene was very sexy. And then we get into all the other toxic shit in this book. Like, but like chapter three, like getting head, 
great. I do, en- I do enjoy a very early on in the book sexual encounter. So I, I will mm-hmm. agree with that. I appreciate it that that was early on. Yeah. Yes. But that was it. Like the other sex scenes, I was like, meh. So, so there we go. So the sex scenes are <laughs> meh. The book has a confusing um, message. There's another book that is in a similar vein that does this better. Ah. Uh, so yeah. uh, we recommend the other book then. <laughs> we recommend How to Fail at Flirting by Denise yes. Williams. We've done Please. this episode. You can go back and listen to that episode. Uh, that episode also has content warnings. So if you barely got through this episode, maybe don't. And I'm sorry. I mean, having said that, I feel like we uh, we just like spewed some words out on this episode, but didn't yeah. quite like delve into. We didn't get too deep so but we did yeah, not get too point. deep so yeah um yeah what any any last thoughts or just like are you gonna go scream into the void and i mean i oh, well, like okay. i have a question i have a question what are you going to do to purge this book from your entire being and aura and vibe well, I already did. Uh, I uh, read Talia Hibbard's recently re-released novella, Guarding Temptation. Um, it's super quick. Contains at least four ridiculously hot sex scenes. Uh, it is not toxic in any way. Um, it is. It is very feminist, very forward in terms of what she needs and how he can help her get there. Uh, It is a delight. It did make me want to get naked. Find the uh, naked review of that on our Instagram. Uh, It is, it is so hot. So good. So Talia Hibbard. So that was, that was my uh, palate cleanser was the new Talia Hibbard. Thank you, Talia Hibbard for that. (laughs) Very nice. Excellent. Um, I am currently reading Dune. And it is as fantastic as everyone says. So I have completely run away from romance for a little while, for 639 pages. I'll be back. But in the meantime, I'm going to be playing in the sand. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, come back and and read Talia Hibbard's uh, Guarding Temptation. It's it's short. Oh, I plan to. It gets gets you in all the right bits. (laughs) Hmm. I know what I said. (laughs) <laughs> all right goodbye so are you dear audience human gonna pick up this book now that you've heard our review let us know in the comments have a suggestion for another review slide on into our dms if you like this adventure in books or updates on our upcoming projects please follow like save subscribe rate review us on instagram at l.skyford on twitch at lskyford and on twitter at skyfordl Phew. I'm Sky. And I'm Ford. That's it for this episode. We will see you next time on Booklandia, where every book is a whole world to explore. And we're out.